Thank you everyone for joining uh, for our last breakout session for CopperCon 2021. I hope you've enjoyed the conference. Um, and we welcome back and we end where we started um, with Dr. Brian Mittman, um, who it briefly introduced his form and function technique that he's developed with a number of his colleagues over the years. Uh, he, he shared it briefly in the opening keynote, and now we look forward to getting into more details on how to apply this technique. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Mittman. Thank you. So let me uh, make sure that I'm sharing screen. I, I assume you can all see this. So uh, I'm going to give you a, um, uh, just a few minutes of um, a sort of review of, of uh, an expansion elaboration of what I covered in the keynote, um, uh, and then um, uh, launch into uh, the exercise itself, the workshop, and talk through a set of examples and um, uh, you know, have us um, apply, <laughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, apply the same approach to some of your own projects. So um, just a couple of notes on this um, uh, slide. Uh, there's been a, a fair amount of back and forth in recent years between uh, using the term complex interventions and complex health interventions. Uh, I prefer complex health interventions, uh, just as I prefer uh, to talk about implementation science and health uh, rather than implementation science, because, you know, there are complex interventions in other domains. Uh, and then, uh, you know, there's also been a fair amount of back and forth as to whether we should be using the term matrix or menu. Uh, to describe the tool, the framework that I'll present. So um, uh, just some uh, quick background comments. So, um, uh, you know, this is, uh, I, I suppose, the, uh, the overall theme, uh, adaptation happens. Um, you know, we know that when we're dealing with complex health interventions, uh, uh, generally speaking, they can be adapted. Generally speaking, they will be adapted, irrespective of our efforts to uh, try to enforce fidelity and adherence to a manualized intervention. But more importantly, as I indicated in the uh, keynote, uh, typically they should be adapted because adaptation allows us to uh, enhance effectiveness and enhance fit. And I know you all know this and that's why you're here, but um, it is sort of a fundamental idea. Uh, that the corollary, the consequence of course, is that rather than ignoring adaptation or suppressing it, as we often do, uh, when we're trying to achieve fidelity and internal validity, we should essentially be embracing adaptation we should be studying it. And ultimately, uh, our goal is to guide adaptation. You know, when we say that adaptation or that uh, intervention should be adapted, that doesn't mean that we should allow uh, uh, intervention users to modify as they uh, you know, see fit. As researchers, it's our responsibility to guide that adaptation. So but just a side note uh, uh, on the, the use of the term adapt versus tailor. I actually prefer tailoring rather than adaptation because one way in which we understand the term uh, uh, to adapt an intervention or adaptation is that we start with a core version, a standardized version of an evidence-based practice or an intervention. And we take that core standardized version and when we bring it into new settings, we adapt it or we modify it. That to me is problematic because it accords special status to that standard or core or baseline version. Um, you know, oftentimes we publish our first study uh, of an intervention and we publish the manual and basically say, this is the uh, evidence-based version of the intervention. If you adapt it, uh, you know, buyer beware. Uh, uh, you know, we can guarantee that you'll see uh, positive effects if you use the intervention as we did. Uh, but moving away from that um, uh, core version could be potentially problematic. You know, of course, uh, again, you're all here because you know that's not the case. And uh, uh, so the question is whether, uh, you know, instead of a core version that we then use as our base to adapt and, and you know, develop different variations, uh, instead if we have some underlying template or a foundational outline or a set of core principles or core functions, and from that set of core functions, we then derive or develop different versions of the intervention. The very first study that we conduct is just one of many different versions of the intervention that we may have developed. And obviously it's developed and optimized for or tailored for that specific set of settings. And so, you know, I like to argue that if you say you have an evidence-based intervention, a complex health intervention, uh, and you try to argue that um, uh, using this uh, is, is um, uh, you know, the appropriate way to achieve um, a good outcomes, you know, I think it's more effective uh, and more uh, accurate and useful to um, uh, basically say that, you know, that particular version of the intervention 
was effective at that particular point in time for that set of settings. And we don't know anything at all about how it's likely to play out in other settings. Uh, so again, uh, you know, I prefer the term tailor rather than adapt only because of this possible interpretation of adaptation that implies there is a single version of the intervention that is somehow better or has special status. Um, and I don't think that's the case. I won't spend any time on this. I encourage you to take a look at the slides later. Uh, but this is one way of uh, comparing simple interventions uh, such as drugs to uh, complex health interventions uh, which have multiple components. Uh, um, they typically target multiple levels. Uh, they typically uh, pursue multiple goals, and the settings oftentimes are more heterogeneous and more dynamic. And as a consequence, we see uh, extreme complexity and stability. We see lots of heterogeneity. And uh, on balance, we see very weak main effects uh, when we take the average effect size estimate. So one important point, and that is that um, uh, this is not a dichotomy. Everything is complex. Um, uh, you know, even a surgical procedure uh, can be viewed as a complex health intervention because it is highly dependent on surgeon skill, uh, on the pre-op uh, uh, processes, on a lot of other factors, and a lot of those elements are uh, adaptable. Uh, precision medicine is moving us in the direction of adaptable or tailorable uh, clinical interventions, drugs, uh, and so on. So um, you know, I think the world is generally recognizing that um, uh, things are more complex than we'd like them to be. And um, you know, this set of ideas about dealing with complex health interventions uh, has um, broad relevance. So uh, just a couple more points before I move into the exercise. One of them is the fact that um, you know, we need to keep in mind what we are trying to do when we uh, develop and study complex health interventions and develop algorithms or guidance for local tailoring. We would ideally like to provide our decision makers, potential adopters and users of our interventions with guidance in how to choose the appropriate program or intervention given their context. And this is relevant, of course, when there are multiple interventions to choose from in addition to uh, opportunities to tailor any one of those interventions. We know that the way in which we implement uh, complex health interventions can influence effectiveness. So we need to provide guidance for implementation or how to uh, uh, deploy the, uh, the programs or the interventions. Uh, you know, we know again that we can adapt or tailor or customize. So we need to provide research-based guidance for that tailoring process. And we also know that the context in the case of implementation in healthcare delivery organizations, it's the organization of um, healthcare delivery interventions, I mean, uh, the organization is the setting and the organization or the setting, the context can be modified. So we have a lot of forms of leverage or degrees of freedom. And as researchers, we should be studying and ultimately providing evidence and guidance and relevant insights for all of these. So ultimately, we are trying to answer questions such as how, when, when, uh, and where do these interventions work, and how can I modify them and modify the context in order to make them more effective. So onward to um, the concepts of uh, core functions versus form. So this is an alternative to um, thinking about uh, complex health interventions as a set of core components. Now, if you read uh, literature uh, that uses the word core components, there are some variations in the way in which it's used. Uh, I would actually prefer that we not use the word core components uh, and instead use core functions because too often components are used as a way of describing activities or um, what I think we should uh, label as forms. Uh, and as the core function form framework suggests, uh, there are no core forms. Um, uh, there are uh, multiple forms that are available for us to use in carrying out a core function. So what is a core function and what is a form? And, and again, uh, this is a uh, framework that was introduced by Penelope Hall a number of years ago. Uh, she's written a bit about it um, uh, since then. She, I believe, is in semi-retirement, but still um, active in some projects. Uh, but it's been only uh, within the last oh, two, three, four years that um, you know this uh, a framework has begun to be recognized and um, used uh, both in the implementation science field, but broader fields that deal with complex health interventions. So the question is, um, uh, what is a function? What is a form? Uh, 
the core functions of a complex health intervention are its core purposes or its intended effects. Um, uh, you know, the underlying purposes of that intervention. The forms are the actual components or activities that carry out or operationalize those functions. And let me give some examples, um, which I think will make this um, uh, more intuitive and, and easier to remember and apply to other um, uh, types of uh, health interventions and settings. So we can think about physical activity as a core function. And of course, there are a number of different forms that we can uh, rely on for physical activity. Similarly with patient education, and this is something I'll come back to in, in the, uh, the exercise and um, the example that I present. Uh, there are a number of forms uh, in the case of um, uh, readmission reduction interventions, where one of the core functions is to assure that we convey information about the inpatient stay to the primary care uh, outpatient physician so that there is seamless um, uh, care and, and good continuity of care. We know that we can carry out or operationalize that information transfer function through a shared electronic health record, through a discharge summary. We can fax or email or, or mail a letter. So again, there are different forms or activities that we can use to carry out uh, that function. Uh, the final example on this slide is um, a list of different functions uh, rather than forms. So in the case of smoking cessation interventions, uh, we know that um, uh, there are a number of core functions. Ideally, a smoking cessation intervention would provide some form of nicotine replacement, be that a patch or gum, uh, some form of uh, motivation and some form of support. So this all comes together in a matrix that I'll get to in a few minutes, but just um, by way of, of trying to sort of reinforce the argument that we need to be thinking about core functions and forms rather than core components. Let me give you a few examples of how we can go wrong, um, go astray if we do not think about core functions. So um, uh, many of you are familiar with um, academic detailing and drug detailing. Uh, it's an intervention in which we have an individual um, expert um, or a drug detailer or rep who speaks to the target physicians. Uh, there are two core functions actually that are carried out by that individual. One of them is to convey information and education and knowledge, but the other is to convey professional norms. So when we are training drug detailers, we need to make sure that they are aware that the interactions in which they, that, that they conduct need to not only be informative, but also to provide, in some cases perhaps subtle, indications that the, uh, the prescribing practice that they are advocating is not only supported by evidence, but it's accepted uh, in the profession. And in fact, the um, uh, physicians who are uh, more up to date in their practice are using that uh, particular uh, drug or prescribing in that manner. Uh, similarly with audit and feedback, another very well-established um, uh, 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 long-standing um, intervention in the implementation science world. Uh, and again, that particular intervention conveys two core functions, one of which is information, telling physicians how they are practicing relative to their peers, but it also conveys, again, professional norms and leadership expectations. And if we think about different variations of an audit and feedback intervention, uh, we can think about ways of simplifying audit and feedback that actually inadvertently leaves out uh, the leadership expectation or professional norm part of the um, uh, process. So again, recognizing the core functions uh, is important. One more um, uh, example, and that is um, quality improvement collaboratives uh, uh, for which one of the key features is a multidisciplinary team. If we're dealing with a high infection rate um, after surgery, the QI team that we convene should include not only the physicians and nurses who are working in the OR, but also the janitorial staff, the housekeeping staff. And there are two reasons for that. One is that the multidisciplinary um, uh, nature of the team ensures that all of the expertise and knowledge is at hand when the team tries to identify root causes and problem solve. But it's also important at the tail end of the process when the team goes to implement its findings and its recommendations. If you have a QI team comprised only of physicians and nurses that basically uh, blame the infection rate on the housekeeping staff, and there were no housekeeping staff uh, involved in that team, 
the targets of that recommendation, the housekeeping staff who are being told to do a better job of wiping down the walls, are likely to reject or not completely accept the recommendation. So again, two different functions that we need to keep in mind when we um, uh, you know, think about this particular intervention in order to ensure that um, uh, you know, it, it achieves its uh, goals. So um, just another few comments before I move to the exercise. And, and uh, you know, these are points that um, I made for the most part during the keynote. Um, one of them uh, is the idea that a manualized intervention that goes into great detail as to who should do what and when and how, it includes a very detailed script, oftentimes is counterproductive. Uh, we don't want to, you know, in a sense, micromanage by specifying language and scripts that may have been optimal for the settings in which the intervention was developed, but may be completely inappropriate for other settings. A quick story on this one uh, uh, relates to um, uh, the Stanford developed uh, self-management um, uh, intervention, patient intervention, uh, and the story that may or may not be true that um, uh, that uh, self-management program was being delivered in uh, uh, a church in Baltimore. Uh, and the uh, woman who was leading the um, intervention, the education session, teaching the church members how to self-manage for diabetes, uh, uh, for example, uh, was not following the manual. And there were research assistants from the study team sitting in the back listening and afterwards came up to the leader of the program and basically said, you know, you did a nice job, but we noticed that you weren't using the script from the manual. As you know, this is an evidence-based manualized intervention and you are guaranteed to see positive outcomes if you follow the manual and the script. Why didn't you follow the script? And the leader said, well, as you know, that manual and that script were written in Stanford English and we don't speak Stanford English here. So just one illustration of the need to um, uh, tailor and recognize local context and not over-specify our interventions. I've talked about core components. Um, uh, fidelity, I think there's an obvious implication of all of this, and that is that we shouldn't be measuring fidelity to the manual or the detailed specification, but instead fidelity to the function. In many cases, it doesn't matter which version of patient education we select, as long as that version is actually appropriate and effective for the target audience. So we want to achieve the core function, not follow the cookbook or the recipe for the form. Uh, and then the last couple of uh, comments just have to do with the fact that, um, uh, you know, a so-called evidence-based intervention for which we have good evidence of effectiveness in one or more studies basically tells us that that intervention was effective in the form in which it was delivered in those settings at that time. It may or may not have much predictive value regarding the effectiveness of that intervention in a future time point in other settings. So we need to think about not necessarily generating evidence as a, an estimate of an effect size, but instead developing understanding and offering insights and guidance based on research, of course, uh, but it's a different way of thinking about um, uh, the purpose of research. And then finally, before I switch over to my um, uh, next set of slides after a break for some questions and discussion, uh, as I indicated in the keynote, these are um, uh, operationalized and um, uh, captured in the PCORI uh, method standards for complex health interventions. So um, uh, those of you who are seeking funding from PCORI uh, really have no choice but to uh, apply the core function form uh, menu or matrix approach. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, those of us who advocate for this approach feel that it's uh, relevant for all types of uh, studies on complex health interventions funded by uh, any source. So let me stop at this point and uh, let's have some discussion on the basic concepts. And then, as I said, what I'd like to do is walk you through three or four slides that represent a, an illustration of how to develop a core function form matrix. Uh, and then we can talk a bit about how that approach would apply to uh, other kinds of settings. So let me stop sharing and um, encourage uh, all of you to um, uh, open up your video or unmute and um, offer any thoughts or uh, comments or feedback. I don't think there's an easy way to do this in an organized manner. So um, I think uh, blurting out, uh, for lack of a better term, is the best way to approach it. I'll um, uh, take a look at the chat in the meantime. But if anybody does have any thoughts, please uh, chime in. I, I'm happy to blurt out to get things started here. Thank um, you. <laughs> huge fan of the idea of complex health intervention, focusing on 
function over form. Um, I, and I think a few other people on this call are sort of in that early career stage as well, where it seems daunting to try to get funded for a large complex health intervention with multi-level implementation strategies with, uh, you know, across a variety of contexts. And so how do we get from sort of where we are early career wise to like packaging our interventions with all that complexity in a way that funders will be like, okay, this guy knows what he's doing or this guy knows what she's doing. <laughs> It's a problem, and uh, you know there's a long list of sort of uh, necessary next steps to, uh, as I like to say, make the world safer for those of us who like to study complex health interventions and would like to do so in an appropriate manner. Um, I think PCORI is moving in the direction of recognizing the complexity and the need for multiple data collection analysis activities. Um, if I can make a, a shameless plug for um, one of the NCI training programs, the Multi-Level Intervention um, uh, Training Institute. Uh, that is also, uh, you know, working hard to advocate within NCI and NIH for the importance of these kinds of approaches and uh, recognition of the, um, you know, added data collection analysis uh, uh, activity and resources that are needed. Um, you know, I used to say four or five years ago when I began talking about complex health interventions and, you know, sort of pushing the core function form that, um, you know, beware because we're out on a, um, a limb. Um, when we talk about this, reviewers are not familiar with it. Um, you know, and, and, you know, as we all know, uh, some reviewers at least uh, view themselves as having been selected to serve on a review panel because they know what to do. Uh, and therefore, if you're proposing something that doesn't match their understanding, um, uh, they're not interested. Others, of course, are open to be convinced that there may be some ideas out there that are, that are new. Um, you know, I still feel that we're out on a limb, but that limb is much thicker. And um, the resources that I need to put together and, and um, uh, make available will list what is fortunately a growing uh, number of articles that are, uh, have been published that use the core function and form. So, you know, I think with any relatively new idea, you know, in the grant application, making sure that you explicitly state that this is a newer approach so that those reviewers who are not familiar with it can be told directly, you know, we know that you're not familiar with this or may not be. And then, of course, you know, cite perhaps more references than you otherwise might that document and help argue that this is legitimate and accepted and, and make statements about how it is, you know, new and emerging or, uh, you know, still becoming accepted. Uh, but again, you know, the number of published papers is my reason for saying that that limb is much thicker and we're much safer. Otherwise, as far as, you know, the big picture issues of, of um, you know, recognizing the need for, uh, you know, larger budgets and more time, it's, it's a work in progress. And, you know, there is no easy answer for that other than for all of us to, um, you know, try to advocate and, and you know, I suppose, educate our uh, uh, funding agency colleagues. Yeah, related to that comment, I was wondering if there's any example language that anyone else has used in a grant to describe the form function and how that went in a proposal or anything like that. Yeah, no, that's a good idea and a, a good suggestion, actually consistent with something that we're trying to do in, in the uh, in multi, the multi-level training um, uh, intervention training institute, which is, um, uh, you know, which, which is dealing with, uh, you know, a related but somewhat separate set of, uh, you know, innovative methods and so on. Uh, and we're trying to find good examples. Uh, let me work on that and see what I can do. Um, you know, citing, uh, actually, uh, Matthew, back to your question as well, you know, citing the PCORI method standards is, I think, important as well. And, you know, some reviewers are aware of and respectful of, um, others may not be. Uh, but again, it's it's part of, uh, you know, explaining how these are legitimate. But the idea um, of, you know, finding some model language that, you know, conveys the, uh, you know, that introduction and the justification and so on, um, uh, I think is a good idea. I have, you know, obviously a couple, if you have any, um, uh, you know, colleagues who submitted to PCORI and who actually use the uh, method standards, you know, they should have some text as well, but let me see what I can pull out. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think this maps on really well to the multi-phase optimization framework. Yes, sure. That you're, you know, identifying the components or forms mm -hmm of the intervention that um, are effective in different ways and if they you know work together well or if they don't work together well and I think with the most framework there's a lot of language um, online about how to pitch an integrant and how to say you know what are the um, advantages of using this framework and I think 
having that online is really nice for when I went to write a grant as an early career researcher to um, use this idea, even though it's not something that a lot of people use and know about right now. Sure. No, that's uh, so I'll take a look at that and use that as a model, see what I can uh, do to emulate that approach. Any other uh, thoughts or comments on you know this first set of remarks before we turn to uh, the more active part of the uh, uh, the workshop? Okay. I have a question me... about maybe sure. I'll jump into this, but I would love to know if you or any of the other people working on forms and functions, which we absolutely love and think kind of is the future, have linked them to different kinds of behavior change theories, because it seems so sure. obvious that you could link the function to behavior change theories, right? Some behavior change wheel already explicitly does some of that. Um, but are there alternatives, behavior change theories that, that those could be linked to so that we could ultimately more effectively link them out to some of the implementation strategies and the forms and functions of those? Sure. So um, at the CERC uh, conference, um, uh, what was a year and a half ago, I, I suppose, um, uh, for those of you who attended, um, Byron Powell and Carol Lewis and uh, you know a few others and I, um, you know, were uh, discussing this very point. And um, you know, there is a sort of low-level activity trying to expand the work that Byron's done in the past on. Uh, intervention uh, implementation strategies to do just what you're suggesting, Julia. So I fully agree that that's really the way that this should be handled and how all of it should come together. Um, but it is uh, a work in progress. I think anyone who's interested in, uh, you know, taking on a piece of this, uh, Byron is sort of, uh, you know, command central, and I think has some ideas to, uh, you know, what the big plan, the big picture, and the overall plan look like. Um, but but I completely agree that that's where we'd like to go. Okay, let me walk through an example of um, you know developing a function form matrix, and I'd like to do so with um, you know this sort of um, hypothetical um, uh, causal model uh, for uh, interventions to improve HPV vaccination rates. So you know, right hand side, we're trying to improve rates. We know that the key precursors to uh, uh, better rates are patient and parent acceptance and clinician and staff uh, behaviors. And I suppose there should be a, um, an arrow pointing from uh, clinician staff optimal behaviors up to patient parent acceptance. But um, you know, in these kinds of diagrams, as you know, um, uh, you know, just about everything causes everything else. So you have to uh, be somewhat selective in the arrows. Um, the red font uh, captures um, contextual factors, uh, community level factors that both influence uh, our precursors directly but also have a moderating effect on other uh, interventions. The black font captures the um, uh, intervention activities. So this is a typical multi-level intervention uh, that is attempting to increase patient and parent knowledge and motivation and improve their beliefs and uh, so on in order to increase the likelihood that they are accepting of and ideally even seek out the vaccine uh, and also to um, influence uh, clinician and staff behaviors. And over in the far um, uh, lower left corner, you can see that um, you know, this is a multi-level intervention that has organization, clinic level activities, um, clinician or staff level and patient level. So uh, you know, the details here are not important, but this is sort of uh, you know, step one in developing a function form matrix or menu. Uh, the next step is to make a list of the needs. So the basic approach is quite simple. It's a matter of developing a three-column table. Uh, and Julia's comment about um, you know integrating and combining this with um, you know uh, the individual strategies, behavior change wheel, and so on. Um, you know that could be an additional column. Uh, but in terms of trying to uh, design your uh, uh, complex health intervention. Uh, you know, you basically be begin by trying to identify the barriers or the needs, and each barrier has an associated core function or two. So if you're trying to improve HPV vaccination rates, first thing you need to do, new, to do is um, uh, determine the vaccination, vaccination status of your patient. Um, so the, um, uh, you know, the core functions are to track the status, and then to uh, make that status known to the care team. So those are two core functions. Um, I won't go through all of these on this slide because I have individual slides for um, each of these. So um, here's an example of the full menu or matrix for that first need. 
So as you can see, just as the example that I gave um, in my earlier remarks, um, if you look at the bottom half of the slide, there are different forms that we can use in order to notify the care team and the patient. Uh, and you know, this list of forms is uh, and should be viewed as a starting list rather than a complete list. And one of the goals of our research is uh, to not only uh, you know, develop a list of forms so that sites that are using the intervention have some guidance, but also learn from them and have them collaborate with us to develop uh, a longer list of forms. Let me move to the next one and just walk through this briefly and then um, uh, stop and open up for some discussion. Uh, I thought that I'd fix this. There's an extra U at the end there, um, sorry. Uh, so the need and barrier, in this case, um, there are two that are listed on this slide. One of them is the fact that patients and parents have knowledge gaps. And the core function, of course, is just another way of stating the need or the barrier, and that is education. And on the right-hand side is a list of different forms. So again, our goal in designing and deploying and evaluating and then disseminating complex health interventions should begin with a um, documented causal model that is based on relevant theories. That should then uh, lead us to develop a function form matrix or menu by identifying the needs or the barriers that that intervention is meant to address. We restate those needs or barriers as core functions. And then the specific components of the intervention uh, include uh, you know, a list of the different forms. Uh, and we can have only one or two forms in a given version of the intervention, or we may in fact want to include you know, a, a number of these forms and allow the local sites to choose uh, what they prefer. And we're actually doing just that in some work within Kaiser Southern California, where we're convening teams at each of the different facilities and helping them to understand the needs and the core functions, giving them a starting list of forms and working with them to select the mix of forms that they feel are most likely to be effective for their particular site. Just one more comment here, uh, and that is um, HPV vaccination is a nice example uh, because it's one in which we know based on evidence that certain forms are optimal for some target audiences and settings, but not for others. Uh, and in the case of physician education or brief interventions, if we're dealing with patients and community norms where uh, you know, there is a good deal of respect for physicians and uh, uh, you know, adherence to physician recommendations, then it may be that um, you know, physician education is the optimal form of patient education. In other cases, uh, you know, unfortunately, we have patients who are very skeptical and resistant to um, uh, physician uh, uh, education and recommendations, and in the case of HPV vaccination and other vaccinations, may have the erroneous belief that um, they're harmful and that physicians are pushing them because of inappropriate influence by the pharmaceutical industry. And for that particular subset or subgroup of patients, we don't want to use physician education, but instead nurse education or peer education or uh, you know, different forms of social marketing. So again, the idea is to develop the function form menu to try to identify the forms that are likely to be most effective, but then to collect evidence from our empirical studies so that we can provide guidance for the local tailoring and provide this function form menu to future uh, adopters of this intervention, along with a set of uh, you know, recommendations for which particular form or forms to select based on local circumstances. So let me, um, uh, again, stop sharing and open up for some discussion. Well, let me go ahead and uh, keep this on and see if I can uh, actually see you at the same time um, uh, and ask for uh, uh, thoughts and comments and, and questions on this, including you know, examples of, of uh, you know, other function form menus that some of you may have uh, developed and used. Would you include a table like this in a grant submission? We did in a PCORI grant. Uh, 
um, because of the PCORI method standard. Uh, and we wanted to show that we took the function form uh, framework uh, seriously, and we had actually, um, you know, played out uh, what it would look like, and, and you know, developed, and actually, that's where these uh, slides come from. It's an expanded version. We only included one table, um, you know, not this full version uh, of individual tables. But um, you know, the short answer is, if you have space, um, uh, yes. Other reactions, questions. Claudia has a, has a really good question about, uh, so form and function as it relates to an intervention itself and as it relates to implementation strategies of the distinction that um, Brian Garner had pointed out earlier in the presentation. Mm -hmm. how, how do the, is form and function good for both? How does that work? So yes, and, and um, uh, actually, I asked a related question, uh, uh, Brian, after your um, uh, talk about um, you know mediators and moderators of both the clinical intervention as well as the implementation. So um, you know, un unfortunately or fortunately, depending on whether you like dealing with complexity and find it invigorating uh, rather than um, uh, frustrating, um, you know, ideally, uh, you know, we would think through. Uh, the clinical intervention, if we're talking about hybrid study, where we're trying to simultaneously, you know, develop evidence regarding clinical effectiveness, as well as implementation strategies, to the extent that the clinical intervention is a complex health intervention, uh, you know, this is meant to be sort of universal, that any complex health intervention that we deal with, whether it be a collaborative care model or others that have clinical effects uh, or an implementation strategy, uh, a health promotion program, we should not think about those as a set of core components or a manualized intervention, but instead as a uh, you know set of core functions. Um, you know, and and you know, getting back to the comment about linking this to some of the uh, you know theories and implementation strategies. You know, at some point, this should be much easier than it is right now, because you know the examples of patient and, and physician education I think are good ones. We know that many interventions need to address patient knowledge gaps and clinician or health professional knowledge gaps. We should have sort of standardized um, you know, ways of describing those needs and standardized ways of describing the core functions and standardized menus of forms uh, so that we're not you know, sort of reinventing the wheel or starting a blank sheet of paper when we get started. And you know, the hope is that at some point there's enough literature that someone would be willing to go back and conduct some systematic reviews and see if we can collate all of the different studies that have uh, you know, identified a list of barriers and put those together and compare the you know, core function and form lists across those studies. And that would make it easier to you know, sort of uh, you know, do the double work that you're asking about, um, and that is um, uh, you know, trying to um, develop your function form matrix for the clinical intervention as well as the implementation strategy. Other thoughts, um, you know, especially from those of you who've um, uh, struggled with this a bit and have some uh, uh, hard-earned experience to uh, to share. Hey, Brian, um, I have a quick question. So, in the in Proctor and colleagues' uh, paper uh, on specifying implementation strategies, they talk about the action, and I'm trying to think whether or not the action maps more to the function or the form. I would have to go back and reread that paper because I don't remember exactly how they've used that. And it may yeah, be I mean, somewhat... they said like, you know, they're just giving examples like actions, um, you know, provides clinical supervision via phone to answer mm -hmm. questions. I mean, I, I don't know. It just seems like it could be either. It seems like there's a little yeah. bit of a, um, uh, chicken and egg or just, you know, confusion. Well, I don't know. And, yeah. And lack of, so, so, you know, that's one of the key features and in, in points of this whole exercise is to separate the activity from its purpose. And too often we state the activity and, you know, there's another example from the um, uh, quality improvement collaborative world that um, I think is useful. And let me take a minute to uh, explain it because I think it, it illustrates this point. So again, those of you who know something about the breakthrough series quality improvement collaborative method that you know IHI um, uh, developed and, and uh, you know was used very widely, um, you know apparently a number of years ago the VA tried to um, streamline the QIC method uh, 
And the basic method involves a series of in-person meetings where everybody gets together and um, you know learns together and you know conducts joint uh, problem solving and sort of mutual assistance. And then they go back and, and uh, you know do some things on their own. They come back again for another meeting. So one of the ways that VA tried to simplify the process is to um, turn to virtual meetings. And because it's a single system and the clinicians and staff are used to working with each other, you know, the benefits of an in-person meeting they felt weren't quite as important or quite as necessary. The other way that they realized uh, they could streamline the process is by um, centralizing uh, and delegating responsibility for data collection and analysis. So one of the key features of the QIC quality improvement method is each team goes back to its home institution and collects and analyzes data to try to identify root causes and develop different intervention strategies. And, and what the VA said is, gee, we're all in the same system. We have staff who are dedicated to analyzing our EHR data. Why don't we have the local teams you know, delegate responsibility for that data collection analysis to a central team and it'll make the process more efficient. That's fine, but there are actually two core functions of that particular uh, feature of the uh, uh, QIC method. One of them is to analyze data to get answers. So you wanna know something about the proportion of patients who are not getting appropriate care and something about their characteristics. That function is easily fully carried out, operationalized by an offloaded, delegated um, you know, data collection analysis approach. But there's another hidden core function of that particular activity. And that is the active learning that occurs when you as a QI team get your, essentially get your hands dirty by collecting and, and analyzing your own data. And if you offload that task to another team, you don't benefit from that learning. And you're that much worse off in terms of your own deep understanding of how your facility operates and what is causing the problems. So, you know, again, the idea is if you explicitly separate and identify the core functions or the intended purposes, you can then modify and tailor and simplify without worrying about um, you know, eliminating one of the key features of the intervention. So in, in, you know, as I said earlier, you know, similar, Brian, to what you're pointing out in, in that um, article, um, uh, it's quite possible that um, you know, they use the term in the same way that core components are used, where sometimes if you read carefully, when people talk about core components, they're actually referring to core functions. In other instances, when they describe core functions, they're referring to activities or forms. And the form is of secondary importance. It's the underlying activity. Um, so sorry for the long answer, but um, you know, this is part of the clarification that I think you know, is needed to um, you know, help fully uh, you know, operationalize this uh, particular approach. Um, you know, as far as functions being mediators, I think functions are mechanisms of effect. So um, uh, I, you know, exactly where mediators, and there are some mechanisms that don't have any mediators. Um, but again, that's one of the issues that we've been discussing with Byron Paul and others and trying to figure out how to, you know, combine all of these different ideas and approaches for trying to understand and describe and design complex health interventions and study them by understanding mechanisms of effect and identifying mediators and moderators, knowing uh, you know, how they uh, relate to the implementation strategies and the underlying theories um, you know, that tell us how those implementation strategies are expected to achieve their effects. All of these are you know, critical parts of this way of thinking about uh, implementation of complex health interventions. And I think, you know, all of us need to sit down and think through this and, and you know, try to develop some, you know, clear guidance. So the other slides, I had two more slides that show, um, you know, other parts of the uh, function form matrix. But again, it's a, and I know this workshop was mostly about the matrix. It's actually a very simple idea. You know, the needs, the functions, the form. So, uh, you know, I'll make sure that those are posted. Uh, Daniel, I will work on trying to, um, you know, develop some, um, uh, you know, sample language uh, in addition to um, something that we're working on, and that's putting together a annotated bibliography of the other articles that have been published um, and hope that that's all helpful. And, and you know, please follow up with me offline. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, like to talk about these issues and have a role as, uh, you know, member of the Pecori Methodology Committee in trying to uh, you know, advocate for use of this approach and um, anyone who's willing to listen, uh, I'm always happy to talk about it.
another minute or two, I think we have any other uh, uh, last comments or questions. Okay, I want to thank you all uh, for your interest. Um, uh, please uh, uh, stay in touch. Um, uh, good luck and uh, help uh, uh, advocate for uh, more and better funding uh, to do this kind of work properly. So, thanks again. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, wanted to just remind everybody as we wrap up this session, uh, please join us in the final session of the day and of the conference. Uh, you can find that by going back to the conference community schedule. Uh, so we'll see you at that last session. Again, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Mittman. And uh, everybody have a great rest of your day.